<laughs> we have um, my my husband and I have, um, our kid, but we also have um, his daughter. Uh huh. She's an only child, and uh, we we joined our families together when she was about thirteen. And I see a lot of that in her. She looks at my my girls sniping each other and just goes, "What? <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't what I was expecting." Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, it is. Funny. And yes, that was Peppy barking just then. Yeah, well, you know, there's always children or something in my background too. So yeah. I think working from home and always Zooming, I think it's just normal now to, um, you know, to have your life in the background. It's totally okay. Yeah. I think there was a time where you sort of everyone separated life from work and you couldn't have let any of the two cross over, but it's not realistic. No, it's not. And, um, and since I've... Um, started writing and, and understood more about the, the writing world I, I understand more that people actually really appreciate it if they get to see the whole of yeah, it little glimpses that's it yeah, yeah. yeah. you don't need to compartmentalize yourself <laughs> no, no yeah. absolutely not well I think uh we're live on Facebook now Karen so <laughs> hello everyone <laughs> so i'm going to keep an eye on the chat as well as talk to you so hopefully i can multitask um i don't usually multitask very well so we'll see how we go <laughs> so if um people come in uh, whoever's watching and i'll remind people because these kind of live streams people always come in and out of them which is fantastic um and they can always watch it later as well because it's being recorded so if I um if I see any questions in the chat or comments, I'll, I'll um sure to throw them to you. Otherwise, I've got heaps of questions here. But um, welcome everyone to a shot in the dark. I love doing these. I love speaking to crime writers live, and I love having the live stream element and people joining in the conversation. Because I run um, I'm Danny B, and I run the uh, literary podcast Words and Nerds. And often you're just talking to one person without any of that. Um, author interaction. So um, yes, hello Claire. How are you? Claire's on the chat. She's our first one. <laughs> so hello. <Hi>, Claire. Claire. <laughs> and uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat as we go along. So if I keep looking down, I'm not playing um, a phone on my game, a game on my phone. I'm um, checking checking the comments. <laughs> So I'm an author and host of Words and Nerds, as I said, and I love doing these because I just love hearing about authors' journeys and why they write um, and how they got you know, their journey of writing this book. So today we welcome Karen Herbert, who is the author of The Rivermouth and The Castaways of Harewood Hall. She has a Bachelor of Commerce and a Master of Science in Applied Psychology, and I really need to know how that's helped your journey in writing. So we might explore that as well. <laughs> but first up, um, I need to announce the Two Truths, One Lie giveaway. Now, this lucky person wins a crime pack of the latest titles, and I'm a massive fan of crime. So this is an excellent prize, and that goes to Veronica Joy. So, Veronica Joy, I'm sure Fremantle Press will be in contact with you and you can get your crime pack. So, cancel your plans, blank out your calendar, get the tea on and sit on the lounge because you have lots of crime uh, stories to read, which sounds like sounds like the dream, really, Karen. It certainly does. Congratulations, <laughs> Veronica. Oh, um, and that was my dog. Happy to. She said happy to. <laughs> congratulations as well it's good <laughs> excellent okay so first of all um we took your new novel can you give one an elevator pitch as to what that's about oh i'm really bad at this i know um, everyone hates it everyone hates it. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually easier to do this and now when i do this i can i can read the blurb on the back <laughs> so it's a bit like cheating but you'll also see that my copy has these little needle marks which are the responsibility oh. not of the dog down there that's barking but the three-month-old puppy that is fast asleep on the cushion so <laughs> this is the cartoons of Harewood hall it's my second book um it has a very special place in my heart because it's all about um it's all about older people living in community in a retirement village so what happens in Harewood hall is we have an aged care worker josh Josh is a very sweet young man. He's perhaps a little bit wet behind the ears. He's part-time aged care worker and part-time at uni. And one night after going to the tavern with his friends, he impulsively steals two research mice from the university. Um, As you do. 
as you do, as you do. And, you know, he's no eco-warrior. He just feels like he needs to take these two mice home with him. But he can't have them at home, you see, because he still lives at home with his mum and she doesn't like mice. They should be outside. And oh, these two mice are very precious. So he puts them in the basement of the retirement village where he works. Now, this is great for Josh. He learns all about how to feed mice. He spends time with them. The mice are warm. They're happy. They're not getting experimented on. But down there in the basement, well, for a start, one of the mice is getting fatter than the other. Josh doesn't really understand why until his girlfriend explains. And there are funny people coming and going. There are men in white vans. Um, one of the engineers, retired engineers, is wandering around with a spirit level. Um, the older residents are wondering why Josh is coming and going from the basement all the time and his boss is on to him. So, look, we all know that mice from a research lab are probably not the best animals to have in a community with immunocompromised older people. So Josh really needs to find himself a forever home for his very friends before, well, before the guys in the white vans cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great elevator pitch. I was, I was actually settling in getting ready for a story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've got Katie Scott. Hello, Karen. Looking forward to reading the new book. So that's always nice. Oh, hi, Katie. Thank you, you so much fans. for joining us tonight. I hope you have a wine by your side. <laughs> now, what is the significance of the title, specifically the castaways part? Yeah, so castaways, um, it has a dual meaning, doesn't it? Um, mm. Castaways can be desert island castaways like the... Um, like the Christmas function that the residents of Harewood Hall are dreaming up as, as part of the story. The castaways also means things that have outgrown their useful life, um, things that we might throw out onto the scrap heap. And, um, and that dual meaning is not lost on the residents of Harewood Hall when they're thinking about their theme for their Christmas party. And, and I hope it's a... I hope it's a meaning that is not lost on readers either and that they no, look down yes. on the side of um, the older people in Harewood Hall certainly not being um, out, um, outliving their useful life. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting and I, I wanted to know how your experience working in a retirement home shaped your perspective of that time of people's lives and how that influenced the novel. Uh, so much, Danny. Um, you know, I... Um, we're very task oriented in, in aged care. A lot of the time um, we race through our day. We've got care plans that we have to execute. Too many um, uh, clients that we, we have to work with. Um, it, it bounces from one thing to another. Um, and I found working in aged care that it wasn't those things that I did that made the difference. It was spending time with residents who wanted to know that that me with my fancy title and my cute suit and my little heels, um, that, that I knew who they were, that mm. I knew that they were important, that they'd done important things in their lives, that they weren't just a, a little old lady who could only speak about her diabetes or um, a retired engineer who was a pain in the butt because he kept telling me how I did everything wrong. <laughs> they, they wanted to know that they too commanded staff and budgets and drove a nice car yeah. um, and held knowledge that, you know, was useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adam CC, hello, Adam's a fellow author and friend of mine. That is both the bizarrest and equally the most intriguing elevator pitch I've ever heard. I have to check out that book. <laughs> Thank you, madam. <laughs> Very funny. I love these comments. But getting back to what you were saying um, about the whole person, I feel like society does this a lot. You know, you become a mother, then you're just a, a mother. That's it. You know, apparently yeah. you don't have any other interests or desires or passions or anything like that. And, you know, it's the same, I think, as you age. I've spoken to a lot of women who have reached their 50s and 60s who said, you know, all of a sudden they feel invisible. So you can imagine people in a retirement home feel invisible as well. And I've had this thought about, you know, grandparents. So you meet your grandparents at a particular age 
and you only know them at that age. You know, you might see a photo that, you know, of them being young, but you never really always know that whole person. And so I think it's really important for us, you know, as writers and, and people who can talk about books to give those people a voice who become self and voiceless in our society. It's weird because we just like to put people in boxes, don't we? You're a mother now, can't do anything else. You're over a certain age now, you, you know, you're not interesting anymore. So I think your book, you know, really brought that to life. So tell me about making those characters whole people and how important that was to you. I think um, I started writing the book um, with the characters. So I started by drawing character portraits of the people who, who I wanted to have in my story. And as I did that, I, I was thinking very particularly about the people that I, that I knew that I'd worked with in retirement villages and in aged care and all of the different parts of them that made up, made up who they were and made them special. Yeah. And, um, and drawing those characters was, was such a delight because I had the, I had the power as the author to, to make them whole and to bring out their interests and their capabilities. I, I was able to make them the heroes of their own stories. And that was lovely. That was yeah, lovely. It is, it's so important. And I think we're starting to see an emergence of, you know, particularly actresses, you know, over 50 getting roles, which they never had before because all of a sudden, you know, society deems them or someone deems them not interesting, but I always think, you know, you're the person with the most life experience and, you know, you've done so many things. So I think, you know, we should be celebrated at all. I mean, I think we often talk about coming of age as a, a 20 something thing, but yeah. I think you're coming of age forever, your entire life, you're coming of age and you're evolving and you're learning. And can I tell you, um, my sister who turns 50 this year has um, just very quietly on the side, been studying um, her exams to get accepted into medicine. Mm -hmm. So in the year she turns 50, wow. she finally secured an interview. I love that. Yeah, I love that. And I just don't to think... Studying medicine. Wow. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but similar to my mum who never had a career because, you know, she was um, you know, a mother and looked after me and she, that wasn't really, you know, in her life. And then at 50, she wanted to become a librarian. And she's like, oh, I think it's too late. I'm like, oh, just do it. And she did it. And it was like the best 10 years of her life, you know? That is so cool. So I just think if you want to do it, do it. So, I mean, your sister's an amazing testament. Maybe that's in the third book, Karen. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually thinking about that. So how do I get a rural nurse, move her to the city to study medicine and it's then amazing. get her involved in solving a crime? Yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a book in there, hey? Absolutely. Let's okay. write it now. We'll write it between 8 and 8.45. We'll get okay. it, pitch it to Fremantle Press and you'll have a signed by the end. Yeah, but you'll need a dog. <laughs> Two, a barking one. Yeah. <laughs> and one that chews your books. <laughs> yeah, we've got Kai Virtue. He says, yay, go Karen. So I love Oh, hi, Kai. How are you? It's just, I love the book community because everyone is just so supportive and celebratory. It's um, it's really up my alley because I love to celebrate and cheer everyone on. So I love how everyone's just so beautifully supportive. So yeah. I'll keep, keep rolling through the comments as they come through. Now, oh, look, I, I hate talking about COVID-19 and I hate talking about the pandemic because we've just experienced too much of it. But I will ask you one question. So did the experience of the pandemic that we are still experiencing in aged care facilities play a role in your plot at all? No. Oh, good. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this book um, in the six months before COVID hit. Okay, sure. So it wasn't influenced by it. And, yep. um, and we, my husband and I had a little bit of a laugh because uh, when it got accepted, because COVID had been hit, and of course there is a, 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 well, it's not even a virus really. It's an infection component to the book. Mm -hmm. But but the the infection here, I did do some research on, and um, and it did really. It's something that had been percolating for ages. So um, if you've been pregnant, or if you have a partner that's been pregnant, or a sister who's been pregnant. 
um, you will know that um, they need to be very careful around cats mm -hmm. because cats carry a parasite called toxoplasmosis. And toxoplasmosis is really dangerous for pregnant women because it can cause you to miscarry. Yep. But toxoplasmosis, and this is where the psychology comes in, um, is a really fascinating parasite because it um, once you've ingested it, it gets into your brain. It doesn't actually reproduce in the brain. Um, it re reproduces in your intestines, but it changes your brain. Oh, wow. So the toxoparasite, its life cycle um, goes from rodents into pussycats, into their intestines where it reproduces, and then it gets pooped out again. Which is why when we're patting cats and handling their feces, we have to wash our hands because then we ingest it as well. So it relies on cats catching mice in order to reproduce. And one of the ways it does that is it manipulates mouse brains so the mice become attracted to the scent of cat pee. <laughs> this is a real education, Karen. I'm getting a real education here. So much so that mice will actively seek out where the pussy cats hang out, offering themselves up as dinner so the parasite can find its way into the digestive tract, tract and out again. Wow. How wild is that, hey? That is it wild. It gets worse, Danny. It gets worse. How could it possibly get worse, Karen? Because... When toxo is ingested by humans, it does the same thing. No. So we then get attracted to the scent of cat pee. Oh. And you know what that explains? Crazy cat ladies. <laughs> That's actually what cra crazy cat ladies are all about. Wow, that is, I'm going to have nightmares about this story. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, wow, that's really interesting. And it's, it's incredible because that parasite obviously that's how it survives. Yeah. So it's actually amazing. Evolution is a wonderful Gross, thing. Gross, and it's horrifying, but it's actually also amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have Katie Scott. She says, Karen, as an author now, which is a significant career change from what you did before, I imagine you need to be very much self-directed as an author. How do you maintain momentum for writing? That's a great question. So there's a lot of procrastination in writing, isn't there? Yeah, look, there is. But um, I was kind of made to be a worker. So I started writing the day after I was made redundant from my job in aged care. And I, um, I came home that evening, had a bit of a salt, had a couple of glasses of wine. And um, the next day I got up, sent my husband off to work. Happy. Come on, come back inside. Um, and um, started writing. And I wrote from nine to five, five days a week, wow. for 12 weeks. And I had I had castaways written. And you know, Katie, I think I was just made to work. Yeah. And I don't actually procrastinate very much. Um, I, I wrote when I finished castaways and I still didn't have a job. Um, I sat down and wrote the river mouth. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was accepted six months after. So yeah, I do need to be self-directed, but that's not one of the things that I'm not good at, I don't think. Um, something that I am not good at though, Katie, is just being alone, being alone every day. That's that's a bit hard. That's a bit hard. I think that's why my dogs are so badly behaved these days, because they're not good friends. <laughs> they're your feet fullers. <laughs> yes. I love that. And I think, um, you know, if you have one of those restless brains, I can certainly relate to that. It is, you always need something to do and something to sort of produce, I think. Is that how you feel? Yeah. And yeah. writing is a wonderful thing, um, especially after senior management life, where you kind of you get in the door and you bounce from one thing to the other all day and you don't seem to spend more than five minutes on every, anything. Mm -hmm. um, but with writing, I can sit here in my lovely office a beautiful and, and office. get really deep into something and, and really get into that lovely flow state. Yeah, and, and that's um, what is the beauty of writing and reading yeah. is that you really are present. You know, you really are present 
in in both of those um, states. And I think it's almost like in a meditative state, you know, yes. um, because you're completely present. And I I think in, in life, sometimes we're not present enough. We're always thinking about the next thing we have to do, the next thing we have to do. So we're very sort of task future oriented. So I like the idea of when you're writing and you're reading, you're just, you're present and you're in the moment. And so I think that's um, it's particularly good for us. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And, and there's some really interesting research coming out now about um, our, our attention spans and the more we train them to get deeply involved in a task, the the effect that that has on our our emotions and our state of mind and our well-being yeah. really positive yeah. stuff yeah absolutely uh katie has also asked um oh first of all kai says oh my god the tangent of that moment of that convo a moment ago <laughs> and he's got little pictures of cats and mice so <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> I, i'm i'm missing the little brain emoji kai <laughs> um, <laughs> and katie says how do you make the characters feel so Real. I mean, you touched on that earlier about looking at the whole person and doing those kind of portraits. But when you're in it um, and you're writing from different perspectives of characters, using dialogue, etc. Um, I don't even know if you know how to do it, but your characters are real and they seem so real. Um, how, how do you make that happen as a writer? I think um, the characters that I've written so far in The River Mouth and in Castaways, um, most of them the ones that people respond to the most are ones that had a starting point with a real person. That's so, um, yeah, it, it is, isn't it? And and people say, oh, well, you know, isn't that a bit dangerous? Because, you know, what if somebody recognises themselves? <laughs> but what I've found, and I don't know if other writers find this, Kai, maybe you can tell me, um, is that you might start with a particular person, like, Josh. Josh started with um, my 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 daughter's boyfriend. Hi, Josh. <laughs> I, I just pictured him. <laughs> Hi, Jack. Um, and but Josh didn't stay, Jack. Yeah. Um, he in my head he looked like him. He spoke like him. He walked like him. But um, and he had the same gentleness. But then he became Josh yeah. as I wrote him into the book. Mm -hmm. And and I, I do wonder, Katie, if that was that's what made these characters in these two books so real. Yeah, I do like that idea of a starting place. And I think even if we don't intentionally do that, I think we must subconsciously be creating our characters based on, if not people, experiences with people of those particular characteristics or those experiences, I imagine. Yeah, and you know, the, the main character in The River Mouth was um, a woman called Sandra who um, tells us right at the start that she's 49 years old. And Sandra is a nurse, she's, um, she's a mother, she's a wife. Um, she has uh, bought the, the fairy tale that you can be all of those things all at once, you can have everything. And she's got to her late 40s and she's so freaking tired. Mm. And she's just gone, what, what the hell just happened? Yeah. And, um, and Sandra, for me, she, she's me, she's my sisters, she's Katie, she's you. Um, she, she's all of my friends and colleagues who have done exactly the same thing. So she's based on all of us. And I don't know how many people have come up to me at book events and say, Sandra is me how did you know yeah. how did you know because it's a common experience and I think this all the time you know that we've been told we can have everything not that we asked for everything and you can't do it all you can't and you don't I don't want to do it all you know but I think we've all been stuck in that um I don't know in that in that dream I guess or what did you call it in that that sort of lie if you like that um you can have it all and that's what you're supposed post have you know I just yeah it's too exhausting you don't want it all no it is, it is too exhausting and I love that my daughter's generation is now going you know I can't work part-time mm. mm. and even relationships people are seeing differently you know I know so many people who have gone into second relationships or second marriages who are considering not even living together 
So it's all these things that we used to do that maybe didn't work for a lot of people and people are just thinking oh. differently now about, you know, about womanhood, about marriage, about jobs, about life, about quality of life and purpose. And I think that's a really, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, the direction of society goes, I think. Especially if people are being more gentle with themselves. Yes. Oh, definitely. And yeah, I think that, I think, I think in the eighties and nineties, we had this real soldier on culture. No matter what was going on, you just got to keep soldiering on. And I really resent that kind of culture because I think there is such, you know, value in in taking the time for yourself, taking care of yourself, taking time out and, and hitting the pause button. And, you know, I don't think there's any value in continuing to soldier on day in, day out. No, no, it doesn't help anyone. No, I don't think it does. Now, I want to know, you've got multiple perspectives in this novel, as you did with The River Mouth. What's the decision behind this? Was it was no decision. Um, I look. I'm still really new at this stuff. <laughs> Especially new when I wrote Castaways. So I I started with these character portraits and and I started to follow the characters through their day. And as that happened, I started to see that they all saw different things mm -hmm. that were happening in the village. And, um, and they all had a different take on it, depending on who they were and what their interests were. And I realised that as the story unfolded through those character portraits, that the only person who had the full story, the only person who could put two and two together was the reader. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> So at some point I went, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna rock, keep rolling with this mm. and see if I can pull this off where I can get all the way through a story and only have the reader know what's going on until right at the very end. Mm, that is it's really interesting that and I think it does. It gives the reader, you know, all those different ideas and perspectives that the other people in the story don't. So that's a that's nice um, as a reader having that extra sort of omniscient view yeah 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 I'm, I'm i'm still a little bit startled that i managed to do that <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you yeah you do right like, mm, how did this all happen you hold your book in your hand like mm, how did this happen <laughs> yeah I'm sitting in the <laughs> and we have a question in the chat how has your experience been working with the frio press team and did you approach writing differently when it came to the castaways of um um, here well, so let's start with the first question. How was your experience um, working with Fremantle? Oh my goodness. Um, I think I was a little bit gormless when they first called me. Um, <laughs> I, I did, couldn't take anything in. I just I, I ended up saying to the, the lovely woman who called me, I said, look, I'm not, I, I can't hear you. Um, I can't just put the phone down and call my mum. Call you back again. <laughs> and and she, she just laughed and she said, yes, of course. I think she is obviously very used to that. But um, I was quite nervous about the editing part because I've heard all these horrible things about editing and um, and how, you know, you had the story taken away from you and you lose ownership. And I knew that's not like that at all. It's, um, it was such a lovely process. Um, first, it was just so... Um, affirming to have another person get so deep into a manuscript that I'd written yeah. and to love it and enjoy it and yeah. tell me back all the things about it that I had hoped that another reader would get from it mm. and that was just that was such confidence boost that was a beautiful thing and then my editor Georgia Richter her her approach and I don't know if this is typical of every editor. I haven't worked with another editor. It was it was very much an appreciative inquiry approach. Mm -hmm. So she would she wouldn't tell me that I'd done anything wrong or that I'd messed something up or this chapter needed to go or my favorite character had to die. It was it was more, um, hey Karen, I don't understand the motive for this character. I can see. That he's got a great life he's got a wonderful child lovely um uh, lovely wife great job he's well off he's got lots of friends why did he do this really stupid thing and and i go oh 
And if I'm honest, I would. I, I also did a bit of, well, she's not very bright, is she? <laughs> she can't get that. And then I'd tell her what the motive was for the character and she'd say, that's fantastic. That's absolutely perfect. Let's put that in the book, shall we? <laughs> and um, and it, that, that's what the conversations were like. Um, yeah. And um, and I loved it. You know, it, it. I felt I felt taller and bigger. I felt like a better writer at the end of it. It was such a delightful process. And then to have um, have the marketing team spend so much time with me and teach me how to to do stuff like this. Um, and to to be interviewed on radio and to write little articles and to present myself in public. Um, that was just like a gift. I feel like I should pay them for it. <laughs> That's amazing. It, it's I love been that. a really supportive, a really supportive environment. I think, um, <laughs> I think with editing, because it is tricky because, you know, it is it takes so much time to write a novel and you put so much of yourself into it. But I think... As long as everyone's approaching the editing process of let's try and make this thing best thing that we can make it together, yeah. I think that's when editing becomes easy because it's not so much a critique of you know your life's work, but it's a let's all come together. And there's so many people and components to make a book that you know we don't often realise. Aren't there though? My goodness. Yeah, I, I did hear um, my editor um, at a seminar once say. Um, the thing you need to remember is your editor is your editor because she loves your manuscript. Mm. If she did not love it, she wouldn't be your editor. Yeah. yeah, I think that's actually really important for the editor to really believe in the work and, and love it, but have the same vision as you, you know, so you can bring that vision, um, you know, in together. That's really important. Yeah. Mm, I love that. Another question from uh, the thread is, are you a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> I'm a bit in between. I'm a bit in between. between. Uh, people who have um, people who have heard me speak will will know that um, the best way I can describe it is writing a novel for me so far is like driving to Geraldton, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm starting in Perth and I'm ending in Geraldton. I know I'll fill up the car on the outskirts of Perth and at that point I'll make the decision whether to take the coast road or the inland road. I like this. About halfway along, no matter which road I take, I'll probably get, I will get, a Chico roll and a chocolate milk. <laughs> um, and But then I don't know what's going to happen on the road. I don't know how many trucks there'll be. Yeah, I like that. Happen. So you've got sort of plot points. Yeah. But uh, in between that, you sort of allow the freedom to surprise yourself. Yes, yes. And I am so surprised at how many surprises there are when you write. That's that's nice though, isn't it? It's wonderful. Yeah. It's so much fun. It's like all those ideas and your brains all coming together to build this thing that didn't exist before. It's pretty amazing. It is. It's great, and you you sort of get to a point where you go, "Oh my gosh, that's the dog that I had back in chapter three. <laughs> that's what I put in there." It's almost like your brain knew all along how the story was going to go. You just I had know. to start with it. I know. <laughs> Our brains are amazing. Humans are amazing. Just don't get near kid litter and you'll be fine. Your brain will remain amazing. <laughs> um, now, we know you mentioned before that this was the first book you wrote. Oh. And the River Mouth was published first. So how did that work? Yeah, look, that's true. Um Talking with my publisher, we felt that the River Mouth was more of a um, uh, traditional Aussie rural crime, if, if there's a traditional Aussie rural crime, and that it would have a broader appeal, especially for somebody who is a complete unknown. And um, and that we would publish that first, and then we would publish Castaway second. And um, and it, as it turns out, it was a really good decision, I think, because three years into a pandemic. Um, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of will amongst readers, me included, to read things that are more gentle, yeah. uh, that are that give you a wry smile, that give you a good feeling, that have a, a happy ending, and and that's what that's what Castaways really is all about. It's that kind of book. It's a cozy crime. Mm -hmm. so I'm glad that we did that in the end. Hmm, that's interesting. What do you prefer? I mean, I think. 
you sort of alluded to it with you know the experience of the pandemic but writing a cozy crime or a mystery suspense is there one you prefer or is it just the book you're writing at the time oh, i don't know danny um i've really still got my trainer wheels on with this um i really enjoyed the river now um I, I i loved that challenge of interweaving plots and perspectives and 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 making it all come together at the end mm -hmm. that was that was so much fun intellectually but it's hard um, isn't it because i think crime has come a long way you know with crime and that's why i think crime resonates crime resonates so much with so many people because nowadays crime has great characters it has multiple plot twists and storylines an unexpected ending um, it's kind of like a psychological exploration yes. of relationships yes. and people together. You know, it's got everything in it, you know, surprise and thrill and those quieter moments and suspense. I mean, uh, there's nothing that crime doesn't have in it. So, oh, it's great. It's great fun. Um, but my third book is different again. And it's, that's a crime novel as well. But it's not a rural crime. It's not a cosy crime. Um, in this one, I explore um, uh, corporate corruption. Oh, and and I I really enjoyed that too. Mm -hmm. I I enjoyed um, picking out the intricacies of what needs to happen for a financial crime to be pulled mm -hmm. off, um, and and the context and the mindset that that sits within. And that's that's completely different to castaways and it's completely different to the river map. So I don't know, maybe I'm just trying on different clothes at the moment. Yeah, no, but that's great. I mean, just because you write one thing doesn't mean you can write, you know, you have to stay exactly writing the same thing and you're still writing in a similar genre. Yeah. And the thing with I think crime, um, the genre is so big and it has so much scope within it, you know, that you can sort of trial these things and still, you know, be a crime writer, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Now we have um, Annie Wilson. Hi, Karen and Danny. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, do you think you write more efficiently now? And is anything you do completely different from your first book? So I know you sort of wrote them out of order, but from and now you're onto your third book. Um, so do you write more efficiently or is it still always like a terrible chaotic mess? <laughs> um, and, and is there anything you do differently now? Um. Oh, there is something. Um, what was it? I thought about it today. Um, yes, there was something that I had forgotten to do. And I think, yes, that's what it was. Um, so with the first three books, what I've done is I've, um, I'll write a bit and I'll get a sense of where the story is going. And then I'll, I'll write a synopsis, a, a, a 250, 300-word synopsis. And, I'll go, and that's enormously useful because it helps me understand what what the story actually is and whether it is the whole thing. Yeah. Um, of course, as I then continue to write, I come back to the synopsis and I find I've written something different. <laughs> <laughs> it still gives me it still gives me some direction, and and I think um, a manuscript that I'm working on at the moment. I was a little, I was floundering a little bit, and and I think what I I haven't done yet is I haven't written a draft synopsis, mm -hmm. so I haven't forced it through in my head to understand yeah. what this book is actually all about and where it's going, mm -hmm. and um and I think I I need to look at disciplines like that that I've learned and that I know have worked for me already, mm -hmm. and I need to remember to keep doing the mania. I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I like that. I like that. But I think every book, you know, even if you do have your plants are kind of writing style, I think then every book becomes a beast of its own, right? I think so. Did you say plants are? That's yeah. Excellent. That's an excellent word. Planner? You're not a planner. You're not a pantsy. It's even between. You're a planner. I'm a <laughs> kind of like prancing, isn't it? Yeah. Prancing <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions here that say they're sort of similar so what do you like reading and what's on your to be read list oh 
Um, I read so many different things, um, but since I've started writing crime and understood that that seems to be where I sit, mm-hmm. I've really made it my business to read more crime yeah. and to read different types of crime, um, so crime that I, I wouldn't normally read. Um, so um, I read, um, last year I read everything that Alan Carter had ever written yeah. <laughs> and, and was, was going through it going, Oh, oh, I see what he did there. And oh, did he really have that back there? And now he's got that up here. And and um and I learned so much. Yep. And at the moment, I'm reading these wonderful crime novels that are uh historical novels, but they're they're true crime. Okay. And I've never read true crime. So I'm reading David Wish Wilson's The Sawdust House mm-hmm. and Lee Straw's Ballroom Murder. And so they are both, uh, the ballroom murder is based on a real event. Um, A young woman murdered a young man on the floor of the ballroom at Government House in Western Australia. Um, And and it's beautifully written. And I, you know, I I sort of came at it and and thought, why did Lee Straw, why has she written this? Uh, We know what happened. Um, mm. We know the outcome in the courts. Um, what's the point of reading this book? But I found that as I was reading it, I was uh, turning pages and turning pages, <laughs> and, turning pages and, and wanted to get through it. And I was, and then while I was doing that, I was thinking, what is it about Lee's writing that is making this story so compelling? Mm. I don't know the answer, but I know I'll learn a lot from it. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, Dave's story is just like, you know, Dave, Dave has written all these wonderful contemporary crime novels. And, and they're, they're, they're great. They're great fun to read. Um, but he's gone and written this, this book that's like he's gone, you know what, I'm sitting about here as a writer. I'm pretty good. I'm just going to go up there. one fell swoop and this book is it's about a um a boxer called yankee sullivan um who uh was brought out to australia as a convict ended up in the united states where he became a professional boxer Mm -hmm. and the story takes place in his prison cell as he's talking to a journalist and the voice the voice in this story is just incredible and the way Dave sustains that through the quality of writing all the way through, I'm just reading it going, you passed it. How did you do that? <laughs> Can I do that? How much practice do I need to be able to write like this? I love how you can read so much and then still be surprised by a book or the writing like that. I read a lot of books as as I'm sure you do. I can see from your background. And so when you get a book that can surprise you and you think, oh, this writing is beautiful. Like it's a great feeling, isn't it? It it is. It is. Yeah. And it it just, it makes you want to write more. It it sends me back. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Amanda has a question. Do you read books uh, physically or do you use audio books? What's your preference and why? I use both. I mm-hmm. use both. I really like the touch and feel of a book. Yeah, me and too. I also like to get my eyes and my head away from, from this thing. Um, I, I think um, just that the backlit screen, I spend too much time in front yeah, of it. I think we all do. <laughs> anyway. um, but when I travel... I, this is just great yeah and and it's always on my desk here with me because I've got all of these books that I've read here um I don't need to go searching for where I've missed Bob <laughs> and and I can look up stuff and I can bookmark stuff easily yeah so yes I use my no, it's great I love having those kind of options you know particularly um in the car like podcasts or audio books yeah. because I feel like otherwise it's sort of time you know you're wasting in the car so I find um that's when I sort of tune into audio books at home I get too distracted so <laughs> I have to be in a space where I can't move <laughs> <laughs> now Karen we're sort of 
sort of drawing to the end of this interview, but I do have two questions left for you. And if there's any questions um, in the comments, I'll, I'll refer to those as well. Now we talked about why other people are drawn to crime writing. Why are you drawn to writing it? I really like the challenge of it. Mm. Um, the, it takes it takes a lot of brain work mm. to um, to layer um, a, a novel and to pull all of those threads together. And then, and it's one thing to then to have reached a a first draft where I feel like I've I've done it and I've done it okay. Um, and I can see the logic in it. But then it's another thing altogether when I give it to beta readers or I give it to an editor and they come back and they go, yeah, I, I'm not, where did this come, supposed to come together? <laughs> Why did he do that? Um, you've lost me here. And, and to then get inside the head of another person and see what they're seeing, that's hard. That's hard work. Because yeah. you, you're so deep in it yourself, you have to then go back and away and then back. And <laughs> I, I enjoy the intellectual rigour of that. Mm. And, and the puzzle too, the puzzle that you think you can't ever solve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes it's like that. <laughs> now, Kai, he's watched uh, this through the whole, you know, he's watched the whole live stream here and he's stealing my thunder. He wants to ask the question that Words and Nerds asks every episode, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give the credit to Kai. Kai has a question for you, Karen. Why do you write? Why? Why do I write? Yeah, um, why? Why do I write? And <laughs> I, I I wrote because I was made redundant, Kai, and I had to do something. I had to occupy myself. I would have gone nuts. There's I mean, only so much house cleaning and dog walking you can do. <laughs> um, but I, I enjoy it. Um, it is so much fun um, and it's good for my brain, it's good for my soul and I meet all these wonderful people in the retirement, retirement in the um, uh, writing community. You know, you think, you think there are lovely people in aged care, right, and there are, there are so many lovely people in aged care, but my goodness, the writing community. Yeah, it's on, it's so, on isn't it? Yeah devoid of ego so yep. supportive um we're all full of self-doubt karen there's no room for ego <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we all need therapy don't we maybe that's what it is maybe i just have all the self -doubt doubt <laughs> like, ego's right over there i can't even see it <laughs> oh, that's great and kai what a great question if i don't say so myself <laughs> <laughs> but look it's been really fun talking to you and I know we've gone on some interesting tangents which I love I love going on interesting tangents um and Katie said it's lovely to have a community and yeah I do think the book community is one of the best um and I feel like I always say this that I feel like if the entire world was a little bit more like the book community I think we'd have a much better world so Aww. I just like to immerse myself into that world and ignore the rest of what's going on <laughs> so that be lovely Good idea to do that. But look, congratulations. Um, Thank you, um, it's a great book, as was The River Mouth. And, you know, I was looking forward to speaking to you about all those things that we spoke to. And, you know, what particularly interests me is really looking at the, the voices that are often uh, voiceless or become voiceless over time. And I think that's, you know, such an important space to write in. I see it emerging. And I think we need to, to keep pushing that as writers. You know, I guess we have that power at least to give you know, the people that society chooses to um, discard in some ways or to put in little boxes, you know, we get them out and um, give them their voice. So I think that's really important. But thank you so much. Is there anything you would like to say to the people who have tuned in, who are going to watch this now or watch this later? Um, Jewel has said, thank you so much. It's been wonderfully inspiring. And he says, love this book. Mm -hmm. um, and Katie says, thanks to Karen and Danny. So that's lovely that we've got the little community um, with us tonight as well. Thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, it's been lovely to chat. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, Fremantle Press. I hope you all have a, a glass of wine or something that you really enjoy drinking or eating to finish off your evening. Absolutely. I've got a bag of twirls here and they've been looking at me for 45 minutes. So I'm probably gonna get into those. <laughs>
I've got chocolate in the fridge. I've just remembered. <laughs> oh, and Holden Shepherd's on here. My mate Holden is like, you congrats, Karen. And oh, thanks, Karen. Holden. We love your work, Holden. Holden's everywhere at the moment with his beautiful new book. So it's a good, good to see you here as well, friend. Yeah. yeah. Fellow Geraldton um, kid. That's right. Mm. You're that Holden kid. You're a kid. <laughs> did you say kid? Gerald's I did kid. say kid, but I'm old, Holden. So you know. <laughs> I think you'd appreciate that. I think you would. <laughs> but thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you for your comments. It's been wonderful speaking to you, Karen. We look forward to um, the third book about uh, corporate corruption. Corporate corruption, vertigo, a public <laughs> investigator who disappears after Friday night drinks. Oh, sounds pretty good. I'm looking forward to that one. Well, thank you and thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.